Well, Vinny, it's uh, so good to see you. And you are one of the uh, journalists, one of the people that has been on the Daybell case from the beginning, all the way back in 2020, if you can believe it, four years now. What are your thoughts that Chad's finally going to trial, Chad Daybell? I, I think this is the big one, right? The Lori Daybell's trial was huge, right? But the trial itself, I felt like Lori was kind of like laying back and just taking it, almost as if she wasn't contesting it to a certain extent because of where, where she is mentally. I see Chad Daybell as a much different person. I mean, that most recent mugshot of Chad Daybell, to me, spoke volumes about where he is. He seems much more like a typical criminal defendant who doesn't want to be locked up, wants to get out, and is going to fight for his freedom. And, and I think this trial will, will demonstrate that. It'll be a much different tone, um, and, I, and I think it'll be much more of a battle inside. So do you think we'll actually hear a defense? Because, you know, in Lori's, <laughs> it, we didn't. Right. We didn't. It was really bizarre. It was strange. But we absolutely will hear a defense here. And and I think the defense is going to be that Alex Cox and Lori uh, Daybell um, are out of their minds. She was, uh, you know, some sort of crazed, stalking woman who trapped Chad Daybell and uh, Lori's crazy homicidal brother, Alex Cox, went out and started, you know, killing people. I mean, I, I think that's what it's going to be like. Um, I think there is some truth in that to a certain extent. Um, but like, if you really look at everything, I think prosecutors have a very strong case, but they're going to have to fight a lot harder here and make sure they tie everything together and are able to connect Chad to Lori and connect Chad to Alex as well and not see them as as having having a, a different vision for what was supposed to happen here. You know, so, like they're, they're all in it together. He has, the prosecution has to connect all three, has to. Right. So if you're Chad Daybell's defense attorney, though, how do you get past the fact that the two kids were buried 20 feet from his back door, you know, 50 feet, and that Tammy Daybell died right there in her house and had marks on her arms by asphyxiation? I don't know. I don't know, but I know there will be an argument. And I, and I know as clear as it looks right now, it'll look less clear inside the courtroom. That's just what happens. It, it happens in trials where there's a vigorous defense. Suddenly things that you sort of said, oh yeah, that's what happened. You're like, is that really what happened? Oh, is that possible? Mm -hmm. And I think we'll see some of that. When I, we, we, I may not be convinced. Um, folks watching at home may not be convinced, but it's not up to us. It's up to these jurors who have to come in with that clean slate of a mind, not be tainted like the rest of us are to a certain extent. And, and, and the prosecution has to build it piece by piece. But while that's happening, the defense is constantly, constantly not giving an inch not giving a centimeter and is contesting every assertion made. And this is what trials are, are, are supposed to be like and generally are like in, you know, 19 out of 20 trials. Lori's wasn't, and this one will be, and that'll be the, the vast difference. And there's going to be an, exp I don't know what that explanation is going to be unless you're in fear of Alex Cox, you are, um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how he could be in that bed. And unless they're going to say it's a coincidence that she died of natural causes, but these two children were murdered. How does that work? Yeah, that, that might be a tough sell. That's right. too coincidental. Well, I there would have been a very different defense for Lori Vallow had she let her attorneys do their job. She oh, was yeah. very much driving that ship and do not go after Chad. The, the, the day that her attorney called Chad Daybell's books stupid, she was visibly upset. She was crying. She refused to speak to him. So there, that, that was as far as it got, as far as any blame on Chad. I think, like you mentioned, with John Pryor, the, the, the cuffs are off. He's going to go all out and point the finger. Oh, he, he will. And 
what, what people have to realize at, at home is, you know, the role of everyone inside the courtroom. And a prosecutor, your job is to seek justice. Justice is the truth. Okay, and, and th whatever it is, whatever the evidence leads to, that is the truth in the case. Your job as a prosecutor is to bring that out. You don't go in there just to get convictions if that's not what the evidence says. And you have to believe in your case. Your evidence has to prove your case. You have to have that conviction yourself. And you don't and, and your only obligation is to make sure that this jury is not misled that you are doing everything you can to point them to the facts in the case that prove your case. The defense attorney who sits in the table next to the prosecutor, you know, is a lawyer like the prosecutor, has a much different ethical obligation. Their ethical obligation is to protect their client within, you know, within the bounds of, of not doing anything illegal. But ethically, you are not married to or obligated to the truth. So defense attorneys, as part of their ethical obligation, can make arguments to things that they may not believe are true or things that actually aren't true. But if the evidence suggests that that's a possibility, they have an ethical obligation to make those arguments. And that's something that I don't think jurors understand necessarily. Like you come into a courtroom and I just served on, on a jury. It wasn't a criminal case though, it was a civil case. Hmm. Um, but in criminal cases, I think jurors come in there and they see two lawyers and they see people making arguments. And they think, okay, it's, it's kind of like even Steven, each side has their lawyer, but their roles are so much different in our system of justice. And they have to be for the system to work. You need someone who's, who's fighting for that accused defendant. And then you need someone who is seeking the truth, not just trying to get a conviction because for whatever reason, you can't be motivated as a prosecutor by anything other than the truth. If you're motivated by vengeance or politics or anything like that, you're not doing your job. You're not fulfilling your ethical obligation. Yeah. Well, this one will be different. As you pointed out, there's different prosecutors. The two main ones are staying, but they, they brought in an, a special DA from the um, attorney general's office. Uh, of course, we have a different attorney for Chad. There's a few different charges, but also there the judge is allowing a broadcast, which yes. I know you have fought for. We fought for from the beginning for Lori's case. It didn't happen. Do you think having this televised live stream for the world to see, is that going to change how things go? Will, will there be a little bit more drama? What do you think? Um, not inside the courtroom. I mean, we've seen it for years at court TV. You know, for a lot of the jurisdictions we go to, you know, like this, it's their first big case. And they're like, oh, you know, no. Once the trial starts, I mean, you go back to what the job of the lawyers are, is or are, the, their jobs. They do their jobs. Their job has nothing to do with the, the, the camera that is uh, broadcasting the case. They don't add any extra, you know, oomph or, you know, <laughs> they don't put on a show for the cameras. The show that they're putting on is for the jury. They want to win the case. The defense is not going to do something crazy because there's cameras there. They're going to do something to try to, to try to raise a reasonable doubt. The prosecution's not going to say something in that courtroom because there's a camera that he wouldn't say otherwise, because he or she is speaking to the jury. The only difference is, is that the public gets to see a public trial. And the public ends up with a much more transparent view of our system, of what's happening, and we'll have a better understanding of the verdict. In the cases where there's no cameras and there are allegations and people talk about a case, then there's like radio silence, nobody sees it, and then there's a verdict, there's less trust in what happened. There's more skepticism about it. But there's much more understanding when we see and hear the evidence and the witnesses, the judge's rulings, and the arguments made. Everything makes much more sense to everyone involved. There's more trust. Yeah. It's our government. I'm not arguing to you, but I'm just saying it's our government. Like we should be able to see what they're up to. You know, there's no sanctity on the judicial branch of government. 
it's like every other branch and it's and it belongs to the people so um we should get to see justice in action and the biggest i'm on my soapbox sorry nate keep talking the biggest, the biggest problem is the supreme court of the united states yeah does not allow cameras in there are you kidding me why why not there is no reason why we shouldn't be able to see what the Supreme Court of the United States is doing, decisions that impact our lives more so than any other cases. Right. And they don't allow it. They allow a audio recording that we can play afterwards. What? Yeah. It makes no sense. But, uh, you know, we've been fighting that fight for a long time. And then, and then every local judge points to the Supreme Court and says, well, they don't do it, so we don't have to do it. Exactly. hopefully that changes it is it is nice to have the fact that we do get to have cameras they are court cameras so they're not the best quality and they might be a little wide we don't have any control over that but um at least there's there's a live feed another difference in this one Vinny, is the fact that chad daybell faces the death penalty whereas Lori vallow did not so you know the stakes seem to be a bit higher there'll be more uh uh focused during jury selection as far as people's views on death versus life. How have you seen in covering cases, you know, for years and and trying cases, is there is there a difference in some of these cases when it's death versus life? Uh, absolutely. Um, the, the first change is the jury selection process is there's a lot more scrutiny. It takes a little bit longer. OK, that's the first thing. Sometimes it takes a lot longer. That's number one. Number two is the way the case is tried based upon the, the facts of the case. Now, this one, they're absolutely fighting and contesting um, guilty, not guilty. You know, the guilt phase of the trial. There are some cases where the person, like in a, a school shooter situation where the person is obviously guilty, there is no defense. And the, the whole trial is about keeping the defendant off of death row. Well, in, in this case now, they're going to fight the guilt phase, but while they're doing that, they are also attempting to save his life at the same time from the beginning all the way to the end. So it, it changes it. Where it also changes the case is rulings by the, the court and by the judge, because every judge in a death penalty case knows that if this case ends in a conviction and ends with someone on death row, that the transcript and every ruling made in that case will be scrutinized by appellate courts all the way up for years. So they are much more, I mean, judges are always careful, but even more careful. And sometimes you may see some rulings that kind of go more in the defense's favor in a death penalty case that might not ordinarily, like some of those that are close calls, sometimes in a death penalty case, the defendant gets more of the benefit of the doubt in a judicial ruling on evidence that comes in because of the scrutiny on these cases and what is at stake. Um, so that's part of it. Now, the other part is the jurors themselves. I think the defense bar, defense attorneys, usually argue that in a death penalty case, that those jurors are more likely to convict someone because these are people that are um, that are okay with a death sentence. They believe if, if, if the crime fits it, it's in, it's it's fine. There are some potential jurors who are just against the death penalty, would never give it under any circumstances, and they get eliminated. Yeah. And defense attorneys believe they might be better um, because maybe they're a little more liberal in their views, and they might be better in, in the guilt phase as well. What what I've found through the years, I don't think there's much of a difference. I really don't. Uh, I look back, and there are death penalty cases where they're found not guilty as well. So I think, I think there's just more scrutiny um, of these jurors and you get to know them a little bit better before the trial than you would otherwise. Right. Right. Well, the one other thing that people are noticed is, is with another change between Chad and Lori's trial. She was charged with conspiracy to commit Tammy Daybell's murder, not first degree, but Chad faces both first degree and conspiracy in Idaho. The sentence could be the same. You can still get life in prison on conspiracy. Um, which Lori got. Is that is that a big change? Are we going to see a different tactic, do you think, from prosecutors because they actually have to prove murder and conspiracy on Tammy? Well, yeah. And, and I think it's not just part of a plan. Like, he's the one there doing it. He's there at the time. Now, with, with the, we know Alex Cox played a big role in, in, in all of this, right? And specifically with the children, 
um, how di how directly was Lori there in in the moment that the the, the lives of the children and of Tammy Daybell are taken? It's not clear, but this is going to be very clear, very and it's and it's a little different. It's like a man who married a woman and took the vows and raised a family, all these children and all these years and all this time together. They're going to make the argument that he is the one that takes her life and we're in the bed, in their bed. Is that where he takes her life? I, I think um, a, a lot of that is going to be, uh, have a much more, I don't want to say the word graphic, but it's much more like specific and real in trying to paint this picture for the jury that this man was so over the top, you know, with wanting a life with this blonde hair, blue eyed woman who rolled into his life, that he's going to, he himself is going to take the opportunity to, to murder this woman in their home. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And, and if, let me tell you, that is powerful stuff. And if the jury convicts him of that, I think they are very close to the death penalty at that moment mm. because of the level of, of the, the coldness that it takes to do that, the level of, of just evil towards this woman who's been nothing but supportive all these years. Wow. To me, that's, that's going to be a big difference in this case. Mm. All right. Well, what, any uh, suggestions or tips you have for what people should be watching as this trial begins and people are tuned in every day for the next two months? What will you be watching for, I should say? And to me, it's all it, like I understand the prosecution's case, but I want to hear specifics of what happened uh, to Tammy Daybell and how it was missed the first time and why the body had to be exhumed uh, and, and the explanations for all of that, I think is are important. I think um, the way the defense approaches Lori and Alex and what exactly the relationship is between those two and how they are not conspiring with Chad is the argument going to be that they're inspired by Chad, but not conspiring with him? Like he has these prophecies and these are just things that he has and that he says, but they're the ones who take them and like twist them and turn them and then start committing murders. Uh, it, I'm going to be listening for that. Like how, did, how, does, how does the defense attempt that separation because they're they're so intertwined, and how do they make that separation? And um, that's what I'm going to be looking for. And will Chad testify? Mm -hmm. Lori didn't. Will Chad is the man who is used to speaking to groups of people and convincing them to believe what he's saying? Right? He had followers. He had followers. Will he have twelve more inside that courtroom? I think that's the biggest question uh, that I'm waiting to see if it will be answered. Interesting. Well, yeah, Lori didn't testify, but she sure spoke at her sentencing hearing. And Ooh. I think that'll be one that you, I won't. Legendary. Forget. Yeah. Vinny, thank you so much. You can catch Vinny Politan every night, closing arguments on court TV. Uh, and uh, we appreciate your insight, Vinny, and look forward to hearing you throughout the next eight weeks, eight to 10 weeks. Thanks so much. Great to see you, Nate. Thanks.